Michael McFall from the class of 1986 and master's, bachelor's and master's degree is the Ken Olivier and Angela Nomolini Professor in the Department of Political Science and the director at the Freeman Spolia Institute. Mike is a proud past resident of Synergy House, so was I until the earthquake, um, where he... And Ujima. And, oh, and Ujima, all right. Just where he lived his sophomore year. He is also an international affairs analyst for NBC News and a columnist for the Washington Post. So he keeps pretty busy. He served for five years in the Obama administration, first as special assistant to the president and senior director for Russian and Eurasian affairs, and then as US ambassador to the Russian Federation. He has authored several books, most recently the New York Times bestseller From Cold War to Hot Peace, an American ambassador in Putin's Russia. Is that what you were signing outside? That's Correct. the book that he... Um, still available. Still, still available. Still and if you available. miss it here on Amazon. <laughs> there, there you go. Um, and uh, his current research interests include American foreign policy, great power relations, and the relationship between democracy and development. In 2019, the Stanford Alumni Association recognized Mike McFall's exceptional volunteer <coughs> service to alumni with the Richard W. Lyman Award. And just last month, he was, order, he was honored with the Order of Merit by President Zelensky of Ukraine. Pretty, yeah. Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> not just everybody that gets the Lyman Award and the Order of Merit <laughs> of Ukraine. Um, he's very active on Twitter, and it says it right here, you should all follow him. That was what was written here, apparently, at McFall. Please join me in welcoming Mike McFall. Thank you. Thank you all. I have to tell you I'm a little surprised. I didn't expect anybody to be here. And you're living in, you're here in paradise for a while. Welcome back, everyone. I live here, but welcome back for those of you visiting. And I tragically, I'm going to talk about some pretty scary things today. So I apologize for that up front. I'm going to end on a good note, if I can get to my last slides. But we are living in pretty scary times. I told you we're in paradise, but we're going to talk about some serious stuff for about 30 or 40 minutes. And then I want to go to your questions. And I just want to remind you where we're at in this moment in history. We're in a moment where we're witnessing the first major conventional war in Europe since World War II. We are witnessing annexation uh, in Europe since the beginning of World War II. And on the cusp, we're not there yet, but, but I would say, having studied wars uh, and teach about wars here at Stanford, uh, this is one of the scariest moments about a return to great power war, again, since World War II. Maybe 1950, maybe Korea, but, but probably not. Uh, I think it's actually more like World War II. And tragically, because of what Mr. Putin is saying, we are now having to worry, at least I'm worried about, the specter of the use of nuclear weapons. And a lot of people like to compare that to 1962, but that's actually not where I, I would go. I think you have to go back to 1945. I think it's actually more uh, a scarier moment uh, like that than even during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So what I'm going to do today, and maybe I'll have to do it from over here, um, I'm going to go through, I'm going to try to answer three or four big questions. I'm going to spend most of my time on how we got here. Because where we're at and where the future is, you can watch me on TV for where we're at. Where the future is, political scientists are bad at predicting the future, so I'm not, not going to pretend I know how. By the way, I worked five years in the government, so is the CIA. Um, uh, so I'm going to really dwell on the first question. How did we get here? Because this is a class without quizzes, right? But then I'll go through those other questions, and if I have enough time, I'll talk about is there a role for Stanford to play in this tragic, horrible, scary time? All right, first, how did we get here? What are the causes of this conflict right now? Why did Putin invade Ukraine when he did? I think there's kind of three big arguments in my world that I want to wrestle with for a while with you. Um, uh, ultimately, I think number three is the most important one, but all of them have a bit of truth to them, right? All right, so let's start with power politics. Anybody here take poli sci 35 from Steve Krasner? All right, all right, so if you had class with, Poly, with, with Steve Krasner, 
you would remember that he talked about the balance of power between states. States are the driver of politics, right? Um, and what I'm showing you here is a thousand years of European history. Um, and what are you seeing? You're seeing some countries become bigger, more powerful. The weaker countries on their border are getting smaller. Sometimes they disappear, right? Poland disappears for a while, Ukraine disappears. And this is a thousand years of history. And so one of the arguments is that this is just normal politics, you know? It is what it is. Whether it's good or bad, that's a different thing. But what you see today, Soviet Union collapsed. Russia was really weak. Uh, Russia's back now. Russia has a lot more power than before. And so Russia's just behaving like a normal great power. And there's nothing new here. This goes back hundreds of years. Some would say thousands of years, all the way back to Thucydides, right? So I want to be clear. Power matters. Let's, let's, not, let's not dismiss power. You're not interested in a lecture about Moldovan threats to uh, security in Europe, right? Well, maybe you are. I don't know. Any Moldovans here? Um, and, and I love Moldova. It's a great country. I didn't, I didn't mean to disparage Moldova. But the point is, ca capabilities matter. Power matters. And countries that don't have those capabilities we're less concerned with. Uh, so power matters. It's part of the story. But I don't think it's a whole story for a couple of reasons here. One, I can think of some powers that have risen that haven't attacked their neighbors, that haven't annexed the territory of their neighbors, right? Japan, Germany after World War II. Even countries like Poland. Poland's a lot stronger today than 30 years ago. I'm not worried about them invading uh, their neighbors or annexing territory. Uh, China, we can come back to that if you're interested in questions. But China is not yet annexing or invading neighbors. And most certainly our country, and when I say our, I'm, I mean, I know we're not all Americans here, so uh, just to be clear, I'm talking about the United States. We've gone to a lot of wars, and I'm happy to talk about uh, those in questions, what, what we've done right, what we've done wrong, uh, but we're not in the business of annexing territory anymore. We were in the past, but we fought World War II in large measure to end annexation. And by the way, for most of the Cold War, with a few exceptions, there are a few exceptions, but most of the Cold War and for the last 30 years, we didn't have major annexation. Now we do, and I don't think power explains that all. The other piece is why now? Why not earlier? Russia had power before. Why, didn't it, why is it now? All right, next, uh, next argument. NATO expansion. It's all our fault. All our fault. We did this, right? We pushed NATO, expanded NATO, then we expanded again in 2004, then we, we flirted with the Georgians and Ukrainians at the Bucharest summit in 2008, and finally Putin just said, enough is enough, I have to push back on NATO. That's an argument very popular in Moscow, by the way, uh, very popular in Berkeley, that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. I apologize for that. <laughs> I love Berkeley. Uh, my wife who's here went to Berkeley Law School. It's a great school. Uh, it's actually popular in the University of Chicago and Harvard. Uh, uh, professors there make this argument. And I want to be clear, just like with the first argument, there's parts of this that are true. It has been a management issue in US-Russian relations and US-Soviet relations for decades to manage relations between NATO and Russia, NATO and the Soviet Union, of course. But it's a little more complicated than just saying it's a straight line uh, of pressure. I think this relationship between NATO and Russia has gone up and down over time. It hasn't been a steady state where they're, we're just charging, 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 and finally he's pushing back. No, it's gone up and down. I'm going to show you some data to support that hypothesis in a minute. Second, though, I want to emphasize on the eve of this war, there was no push for Ukraine to join NATO. That is just disinformation that Moscow wants you to believe. And third, NATO's never invaded Russia. NATO's never invaded the Soviet Union, and I don't think it ever will. So let me walk through these three arguments. And let me quote some people here that are more expert than I about NATO and Russia. Uh, here's, here's a grand strategist from Russia. You can read it. I don't have to read it. Uh, but he's basically saying we should join NATO. Now, hold on. We're told to believe NATO is a major enemy to Russia, and this guy is talking about joining NATO, a Russian strategist? That doesn't make sense to me. That's not data to support that hypothesis. You know who said that? That guy. 
Here's another grand strategist talking about Ukraine NATO. And again, I'll let you read it so I can save my voice. Basic line is here, I, we don't care about NATO Ukraine. That's their problem. That's what they want to do. And you're already going to figure out my game, right? Guess who said that? At the first one was after the first round of NATO expansion, the first quote I just showed you. This one is after the second round of NATO expansion, after it was announced in 2002. And then speed up a little bit, move a forward for a decade. Uh, here's another grand strategist from Russia. This one's different. You can get, get if anybody guesses it right, you get extra credit on your test. Um, he said this. He basically said the conflict between NATO and Russia was over. His name, his name, try again. There we go. Uh, President Medvedev, 2010. He said it at the NATO summit. I was there. I listened to it. And by the way, behind closed doors, we were talking about with Medvedev and President Obama and other leaders at NATO, missile defense cooperation. Yeah, wow, thank you for saying that. Uh, so there's got to be something more to this story, right? The, the, the policy of NATO did not change in 2010 today in terms of expansion. Something else has to be added to the story. And to remind you, I, I was in the government for five years. I was in every meeting that, uh, that President Obama had with Medvedev and Putin. I was on every phone call. I don't remember a time when we discussed the problem of NATO expansion in U.S.-Russian relations. It was a much more cooperative time. I'll skip that for now, but that's where you can buy the book and read all about it. Um, and again, as I said before, in the run-up, there was no new move by NATO for, uh, to bring in Ukraine to join, and everybody knew that. Putin knew that, Kiev knew it, Zelensky knew it, Biden knew it, Brussels knew it. So there's got to be something else to the story. And that gets me to my third variable, that's what we say in academia, uh, factor, cause, you know, that's what we say in English. Um, and this is going to take a little time, so, so stay with me for a bit. But I think the real driver of this conflict has much to do with what happened domestically in Russia over the last 20 years, and much less so what's happened uh, on the outside. Although what's happened on the borders of Russia is going to be a big part of the story. So let me walk you through it. It's a little complicated. First, I want to remind you that, that if you look about in history, and most certainly today, uh, autocracies and democracies don't get along very, very often. Sometimes they do. Uh, sometimes we have allies who are autocrats, although not for the long term. I'd say they're always short-term friends of ours. But if you think about it, in American history, every enemy we've had, including ones that we've gone to war with, have been dictatorships. Every single one. I, you know, I, we can talk about 1812. That's a kind of complicated case. What about 1812? I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, but I have an answer. But, but if you're thinking about the pattern, that's a, that's, a, that's a big pattern. And now think about it right now. The countries that you fear the most, for those of you who are Americans, um, which one of on your list is a democracy? I'm not losing a lot of sleep about Canada. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just not. Uh, and I don't think they're losing a lot of sleep about us, by the way. Uh, they're not worried about us invading. We have the power to do it, by the way. We could take Alberta. No, I, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm from Montana. Uh, um, uh, we're not doing that. Uh, we're going to cut that off of the, of the video, okay? I don't want to get in trouble on that. Um, so this is a general pattern, and I just want to remind you, before we get to the Putin era, that we did cooperate with the Russians and the Soviets in the Gorbachev period, I'm always reminded of George Schultz when I'm, I'm here at the Hoover Institution, one of my mentors. There was a lot of cooperation going on as they democratized and wanted to be part of the West. 90s was the same thing. So it's not always that we've had conflict with Russia and the Soviet Union. That's the first point. Second point, if you go back to when Putin became president, um, and I've followed his career for a long time. We, we met in 1991, by the way. We go way back. Uh, not exactly Facebook friends. Um, <laughs> I'm on the sanctions list. Uh, I can't go to Russia. And by the way, it's really cool to be on the sanctions list now. Everybody's proud of it. I was on there first. I got on in 2014, <laughs> way before everybody else thought it was cool to be on that list. Um, but but if, you, you know, if you look at the trajectory of his thinking, he was an accidental pre president picked by Yeltsin, ratified by the people. Or was not this groundswell for imperialism. That's, that's what Putin wants you to believe. That came much later. Um, and initially, he was very pro-Western. You just saw the quote about NATO, right? Uh, Pro-market. 
especially after September 11th, when we had a common enemy with President Bush, we were doing a lot of cooperative things in those early years. But one thing he was never pro was pro-democracy. He always was against controls on his power as the president. And the longer he stayed in power, the more he began to roll back those checks on his power, right? And be Russia became gradually autocratic uh, to the point now where it's one of the most autocratic countries in the world. And as that happened, tensions with us, with the democratic world, increased. And then there were two what I would call democratic breakthroughs on the borders of Russia. First in Georgia, it's called the Rose Revolution, 2003. Then in Ukraine, 2004, the Orange Revolution. And this democratic expansion, these two variables in the Bush era, these two events, I think were the real cataclysmic confrontational moments uh, where we thought of these as democratic breakthroughs and he thought of them as American-inspired uh, regime change. And that's where the conflict began. We had an in interregnum in the Medvedev era. I'm going to skip that for the purposes of time now. But when Putin comes back for his third term in 2012, he, he started running for president in 2011. He announced in September. You can see him. He's announcing. Um, uh, between the time he announces and the time he wins, uh, two thing, three things happened that I want to tell you about. One, there was a, a democratic election, a parliamentary election, uh, that was falsified in 2011. And I remember I was working in the government at the time. It was like falsified 5, 6, 7%. That's normal for Russia, no big deal. But for those folks, you see them there protesting. This time around, they said it was a big deal because they had smartphones, they could document it. They spun it around on Facebook and Twitter and Vukontakte and got massive mobilization against the regime. Um, and that, by the way, was as, as Putin was coming in, that then made him even more paranoid about us. And, you know, there's a big debate in my field, you know, do, do individuals matter, leaders matter or not? Um, I think they do. Uh, I live in America. The difference between Obama and Trump, pretty big in my view. Uh, but, but in academia, we tend to say, no, there's these kind of structural variables that cause things. We don't need to look in the black box of foreign policy decision making to know what this country or that country wants to do. Well, in my time in the government, when I watched the transition from Medvedev to Putin, it only reinforced that view, that individuals matter. Because what we learned as we began to engage with Putin is that he had a pretty different view than Medvedev back then. Medvedev now has gone crazy, uh, literally. It's embarrassing to watch the way he's talking then. But then he was more like a, a quasi-Gorbachev. And as we began to engage with Putin, it was very clear that he, you know, if Medvedev thought about win-win outcomes, like signing the New START Treaty, he's like, no, world is zero sum. Plus two for America, that's minus two for Russia. Second, Medvedev thought of us as a cooperative partner. Putin, no. Back then, competitor, today, enemy. Remember, he grew up in the KGB, KGB agent. That's his worldview. And then third, uh, as we learned when we talked to him, he thinks that the United States uh, goes around the world fomenting regime change against uh, regimes we don't like. And guess what? Yeah, there's a, some empirical evidence to support that hypothesis, right? <laughs> In fact, we debated it at length at this breakfast. This is about a four-hour breakfast. Uh, this is uh, our first visit to Moscow. This is back when I worked at the White House with President Obama. And we got into this debate, and, and Putin went on about the history of the Bush administration. Uh, and all the mistakes they made. By the way, never once criticizing President Bush. He liked, and so I think probably still does like President Bush. He was the deep state, Dick Cheney, Condoleezza Rice. No, she's not, yeah, yeah, she, uh, that was a joke. But, but, but you know, all those people, those hawks, uh, you know, that drove into the war. And uh, um, we spent a long time on Iraq, of course, where he just went through this long lecture about what a mistake Iraq was. And at the end of it, President Obama is a good listener, by the way. He listened to a, like 55 minutes before he even said the first words. And at the end of it, he said, you're right. That was a mistake. I agree with you. And Putin's like, well, hold on. You're, you're, you're supposed to play the Americans in this debate, right? He never talked to an American who'd ever said that. Think about it. He'd been dealing with President Bush and his team the entire time. 
And, you know, as we got down, you know, we got, got done with the meeting, it was, it was like, okay, maybe these guys are going to be different. I'm going to keep an open mind. Uh, and then 18 months later, you saw mass mobilization against autocratic regimes. And I want to be crystal clear. We did not cause this. I worked at the White House during the Arab Spring. We didn't cause this. Uh, we reacted to it just like everybody else did. But in Putin's mind, it was like, aha, uh -huh. we've seen this before. I already showed you Georgia, right, 2003. I showed you Ukraine, 2004. In his mind, in his theory of the world, here we are, here's the Americans again, fomenting regime change, um, you know, even against their own uh, partners, by the way. Egypt, Mubarak was our partner, and it became a pattern for him. Then Libya, then Syria, this is all in the same year, and then at the end of that year, I already told you about it, it happened in Russia. And in his mind, this is us. We're behind this. People, people are not independent. This has to be the CIA fomenting this. And remember, the last time you had 100,000s of people on the streets of Moscow, that was 1991. That's the year the Soviet Union collapsed. And if you look really, really hard, you can see me. I'm there. Uh, <laughs> I happened to be at this uh, demonstration, and by the way, Putin knows it. Um, and so that became, he became very paranoid about these democratic breakthroughs, these democratic movements. He had to develop an argument that it has to be the, the Americans, the Americans, the Americans are out to get us, they're the ones doing it, not independent thinkers of Russia, it was the Americans. By the way, this is right when I dropped in to become the US ambassador. Uh, correlation is not causation, we teach that here at Stanford. And they began to blame me for fomenting this revolution. Alexei Navalny at the time, uh, he was the leader of the opposition. You can see this is what the Russians are saying. This is McFaul has come to help uh, Navalny to overthrow the regime. By the way, Navalny's daughter goes to school here. I just saw her an hour ago, Dasha. Uh, think about what that does for their conspiratorial theories, right? And so I, I became the poster child of this kind of argument, just so you know. And when I say poster child, I mean literal poster child. <laughs> that is not a metaphor. This is, you know, you've heard a lot about disinformation lately. Well, I, I discovered it decades ago. Uh, that's me on the right, uh, allegedly uh, campaigning for Navalny. I hope you can see that's photoshopped. But I, just to give you a flavor, that's what happened during that time. And we've never recovered from that, I would say, this Russian domestic politics. The final straw, of course, was one more thing. Do you, have you noticed a pattern? I'm showing you photos of hundreds of thousands of people protesting against autocracies. This time it's Ukraine. This time the fall of Yanukovych, President Yanukovych. Uh, he flees to Moscow. The Ukrainians call this their revolution of dignity. Putin calls it uh, a neo-Nazi coup inspired by the United States. And that, I think, explains the conflict we're in right now. It's democratic expansion, not NATO expansion, that has created this tension between Putin and the West and Putin and Ukraine. And there's one more piece of this story I need to add. When Putin talks inside his own country, and I've actually been in meetings with him when he talks this way, he tells his people that we're not part of the West. I showed you a quote 20 years ago when he said they were part of the West, but now he's got a different argument. Um, in fact, I'll tell you an anecdote. I was, I was in Moscow in 2011 with then Vice President Biden, now President Biden, and we met with then Prime Minister Putin, now President. And in the middle, it was kind of a tense meeting. Most meetings with Putin are, by the way. Um, uh, he, he comes very prepared for these meetings, by the way. You should always be prepared. And at one moment, he likes to stare at you. So he, he, he started focusing on Putin. Now, I don't mean to alarm you, but he's like staring, and he's like, you guys look at us. And he went like this. Because, you know, he's thought through everything. He goes, you look at us. You see the color of our skin. We look like you, but we don't think like you. Super dramatic moment. Biden's like, whoa. Afterwards, we're like, whoa. Um, by the way, I was thinking of who my president was, who my boss was when he said that. But, um, <laughs> but he wants Russians to believe that we're not like them anymore, right? That, his argument is about the strong state and Russian culture and conservative values, and we're not part of the decadent West. We're different. But he also wants Russians, and he wanted Ukrainians to believe, that Russians and Ukrainians are the same people from the same history. 
There's no difference between them. Ukrainians are just Russians with accents. And that's why he went, to liberate them from the Nazis so that he could unite the, the country again, to, to unite the nation. And, and he said it very bluntly, by the way, folks. He doesn't, he's not very diplomatic. He, you know, he, he, he said it 70 minutes he spoke on television. I'm probably the only one who watched to the end, but I did. Uh, right before he invaded Ukraine, where he explained this, that they're just like us and we're just, it's finally time to unite with our Slavic brothers uh, who have been divided, A, by the West, but also by the Bolsheviks, by the way. He talked about the Soviets even being involved in that. Well, so you see the contradiction, right? If Ukrainians are practicing democracy, that undermines his argument about us being different than Europe. And that, I think, is the central um, obsession he's had with Ukrainian democracy for all the way back, but especially in 2014, especially after Zelensky was elected, and that's what he went in to try to end. Final precipitants, I'll come back to this in, in questions, but I do think there are some short-term things that changed there in the slide. We can talk about why that finally did, he decided to flip uh, because of the timing of our elections and Zelensky's pivot away from negotiation to a more confrontational approach. All right, I took a long time on point one, but that's, that I think it's important to understand the history. I can go through these next three points a lot faster. So where are we now? I want to remind you what Putin, this is not Mike McFaul, this is what Putin said he was invading Ukraine to achieve. These are his objectives. And let's just do some stock taking. Where is he now? All right, uniting Russians and Ukrainians. Does that mean I got to stop talking? No, okay, good, good. That's just somebody's phone. It's not the timer. Good, good, good. Because I got a long ways to go. All right, um, let's go through these. Has he united Ukrainians and Russians? Obviously not, right? Look at that data. Like, how many places in the world do you have 90% approval rating for a president? We haven't had that forever in our country. Uh, he's done the exact opposite. He's pulled these two nations apart. Second goal, denazify Ukraine. He used that phrase, right? And that, by that, he meant overthrow the Zelensky regime uh, and, and, and take over the country. And that photo, that's a very fam famous photo uh, when, you know, we advise Zelensky and others uh, you know, you need to go to Krakow, Poland, and set up a government in exile. And remember, he said very famously, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. And then he put that video up on, his, uh, on one of his social media things, and he said, we're here, and he's got his, his, his inner circle here, and we're not going anywhere, and guess what? They're still there. Denazification, that's a strange word, right? Remember, uh, Zelensky's first language is Russian. He, his, he, he's got Jewish heritage. The idea that he's a Nazi is absurd, but that was what he wanted to do. He failed at that. Third, demilitarize Ukraine. Exact opposite, right? Ukraine is more militarized today than at any time in its post-Soviet history, and cooperation with NATO is tighter than at any time in its post-Soviet history. We forget, but the, 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 I hope some will remember, the original agenda was to take all of Ukraine, right? Remember the Battle of Kiev? He lost the Battle of Kiev. Remember the battle for Kharkiv? He lost the Battle of Kharkiv. And just recently, the rest of the region of Kharkiv, there's been this incredibly successful counteroffensive. So that objective also lost. Stopping NATO expansion, exact opposite. We got two new members joining as a result of Putin's war. So then he had to adjust. He adjusted his, he, what he told the Russian people that he wants to do. I'm not sure this is where he ends. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But right now, he has this special military operation in defense of Donbass, right? Zashita Donbassa. That's, that's the phrase they had to add to say, we're just going to try to take Donbass. We're just going to try, try to take a region that he calls Nova Russia, that Catherine the Great used to, to, to uh, have in the Russian Empire. That's the four regions you've been reading about. And my prediction is that he wants to liberate them. He wants to uh, gain control of them and then sue for peace. And he's going to say, OK, we're done fighting. You know, let's just let's get the West to put pressure on Zelensky so that we can take this territory. And then I don't predict the long term future, but but so far he would he would stop with that. Ukrainians have a different perspective. They're not, they're not interested in that game plan. Uh, by the way, they're worried that some people in the West are 
uh, uh, interested in that game plan, and they should be worried, in my view. We can talk about that in questions. Uh, but their short-term objective is to liberate Kherson. You, you've all been reading about that. Their long-term objectives are much grander now than they were in the beginning of the war. You can read them there. And how this ends, where are we going? This is my third point. I want to be honest, I don't know. And you shouldn't believe anybody who tells you that they know how this war is going to end, okay? When you see somebody on TV, oh, I give it a 40% probability on this way, 60% this, 20%, that is all hocus pocus made up. Uh, I talk to the Biden administration pretty often. I, I can tell you they don't know how it's going to end. I talk to the Zelensky government pretty often. They don't know how it's, uh, it's going to end. I don't talk to the Putin folks. Uh, but I just want to underscore that in the short term, we, we need to be humble about pretending we know how this ends. I don't know how it ends. I think there's a couple of scenarios that are more likely than not. Uh, Russian victory, I think, is very unlikely. Um, Ukrainian complete victory, maybe. Uh, although that, they've got a long ways to go before that. Uh, and stalemate, which is a way a lot of wars tend to end, I also would say is a, is a maybe as well. What about the long... Oh, I almost skipped this one. Um, <laughs> and I've learned not to skip it because it's always the first question. Um, what about the very scary moment we live in where presidents of Russia with the largest nuclear arsenal in the world or, or tied with us, depending on how you count these weapons, is threatening to use nuclear weapons. Um, and again, I want to be clear, I don't know whether he will and I don't trust people that speak in definitive terms. Uh, I follow this very closely and, and I would say two things. I think the probability of a nuclear strike against us is very, very low because even after the new START treaty, we got rid of 30% of the nuclear weapons in the world, we still have enough weapons to blow them up, they have still have enough to blow us up. I don't think Putin's suicidal, I don't think he wants to end the world. Uh, that's, that's, that's my assessment of him. So I think that's extremely unlikely. What about a tactical nuclear weapon inside Ukraine? That's more likely. I'm worried about that. I want to I wanna be honest, I'm worried about it. What I would predict the consequences are are the following. I think people make the false analogy to Japan 1945. I think that's a completely false analogy. If Putin used a nuclear weapon in Ukraine, my prediction is, and I see some Ukrainians here, so we can get them into the conversation too, uh, Ukrainians wouldn't quit fighting. They would double down and try to take the war to Russia. Who in the world is going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, that was a great idea, a really great military move? There's nobody's going to say that. Even the mullahs in, in Iran are not going to say that. Xi Jinping's not going to say that. He will be completely isolated if he does that. Third, remember, he is threatening to use nuclear weapons to deter us from giving the Ukrainians more sophisticated weapons. And I think we need to be honest, he's succeeding in that. He's doing that, and he's succeeding. We're not giving him the attackums. We're not giving him the big 29s. Uh, he's succeeding. But if he used a nuclear weapon, then why would we be deterred to give him those weapons? I think all bets would be off. Uh, and finally, I'm not so sure Russian military would support this. I used to deal with them. You want to get up and stand up and talk about how it's an absolute necessity to use nuclear weapons for the first time since 1945? I'm not even sure his own people would go along with them. What I don't know, I just gave you my assessment. What I don't know, does Putin share my assessment? That's what makes me worry. All right, I just got the bell. Where are we going long term? And I want to say two words about Stanford before I quit. Um, long term. This is the birth of the Ukrainian nation. I'm convinced of that. This is, this is the road to Europe. It's a long, it's going to be a long one, but they're on their way. The, you know, war has brought the country together. I have no doubt about this. this is, we, the historians are right about this is the moment that Ukraine finally became uh, one of the biggest, most important democratic countries in Europe. Um, that's my prediction. I'm worried about post-war reconstruction. We can talk about that in questions. They've got to get that right. They can't go back to some earlier ways of organizing, you know, the polity and the economy. But I think it, the long-term implications for Ukraine, tragically, because this is a horrible war, but it's going to have a very positive effect on their long-term trajectory. Russia, I think, the exact opposite. I think this is the beginning of the end of Putinism, not Putin, not Putin's role, but his system of rule. And again, I'm not going to try to predict when it happens. Um, and I, I want to I be honest here, you know, like I said, Putin's not a 
big favorite of mine. But analytically, I think it, we would have to say, in fairness to him, before he invaded Ukraine, he did do some things that the Russian people appreciated, right? He restored the economy. Actually, oil and gas prices did that. He had nothing to do with it. But if it happens on your watch, it doesn't matter if you're a Russian president or American, you take credit for it, right? He took credit for that. He stabilized the, the country. He went on a run in foreign policy. He won four wars, right? I just showed you there. And then he overreached in Ukraine. Actually, it reminds me a lot of Brezhnev, who uh, went on this run. marxist leninist regime's taken over all over the place. You know, Indochina, Angola, Mozambique, Nicaragua. It seemed like the correlation of forces were on the sides of the communists. Remember that period? I see enough gray hair. You remember that. And then he overreached in Afghanistan, and that was the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. That, I think, is a, an apt analogy for what's going on there. Because I think the cost of this war to Putin and Putinism are, are going to grow, and I don't see how he reverses any of these costs anytime soon. By the way, that guy right there, Alexei Navalny, that's, that's Dasha's dad. That's who I was just talking about, uh, right as he went back to prison. All right, why should you care and why, why does it matter to us at Stanford? Uh, these are the last two things I'm going to talk about. I think there's a moral reason to care. I, as a small D Democrat, you know, I don't care, color your passport, but when I think about like this war, this horrific war, I personally can't stand by and, and just think, oh, annexation, no big deal. Why do we care? It's far away. That should remind you, you know, we, we made those arguments in 1939, right? Oh, Poland, where is it? We don't know. You know. Not our problem, not our problem, not our problem. I disagree with that. I think it's a slippery slope. Uh, and I think it's immoral for countries to annex the territory of their neighbors. Second, I don't want to return to a world of imperialism and recolonization. Been there, done that. I don't want to go back to that. That was horrific. Lots of people died during that time. I don't want to go back to that war just because it's the way it is. No. Morally, I want to be against that. I don't think we can stand by and watch innocent people being slaughtered, as they have been in Ukraine. Morally, I think that's wrong. And finally, I don't like it when autocratic countries invade democratic countries on moral grounds. Let's say you don't care. Let's say you don't care about that. You're a real politique person, right? You're Kissinger or, or Steve Krasner, you know, poli sci 35 realism, right? Structural realism, if you remember. Um, and I don't know what Steve thinks about the war now, but, but that's, that's the argument. Uh, moral, morality, that's for, you know, people that aren't, they don't really understand the real world. Well, if you're in that camp, then you, you should care a lot about who wins in Ukraine as well. If Ukraine wins, our allies will be reassured. We'll have to spend less money supporting them. China will be deterred. They'll be a little more nervous about invading Taiwan. It was just in Taiwan four weeks ago, five weeks ago by now. Nobody wants the Ukrainians to win more than the, the Taiwanese. Um, and third, democracy might get back on the march. You know, we've been in a 15-year recession in the world in democracy. We're in our 11th year of a democratic recession here in the United States, according to Freedom House. This would mean, you know, maybe history would be on our side again. And exactly the opposite if Ukraine loses. NATO allies will be nervous. We're going to spend a lot of money reassuring them. And your sons and daughters, if they serve in the military, are likely to be deployed closer and closer to Russia if Ukraine loses. China won't, will be emboldened, right? They think we're a paper tiger, we're a declining power. This will reaffirm that theory. The rest of the world will heads their bets. They'll say, oh, the Americans, the West, Europe, democracy, I better just sit on the sidelines here. I don't, I don't want to get into that, right? Uh, and it will appear that democracy is in decline. So this is not just a war for Ukraine. I actually think it's a war for the future of the kind of, of international system that we're going to live in. And that's why I think we just ought to stay the course. More and better weapons, more sanctions, more, less fear of Putin, more confidence in our capabilities, our democratic ideas, because I think a victory in Ukraine is not just a victory for Ukraine, it's a victory for Europe, it's a victory for our security interests, and it's a victory for our values. Last thing, how many minutes I got left? One, perfect. <laughs> I'm doing well. I've never given this talk before, just so you know. This, uh, you're the first, you're, you're my guinea pigs. Uh, I gotta tighten it up for my Stanford students. Um, so, because you're back for the reunion, you know, and I was thinking about this, you know, somebody lives here. So what, what about us? Where, what, what role do we play? 
And, and I want to say we need to play a role. This, these are all photos of Stanford faculty with various Ukrainians. You see me up there with President Zelensky. We hosted him here a year and a half ago. Um, here's some more. Our president, Tessie Levine, Mark Tessie Levine, likes to say we should be a purposeful university. I like that phrase a lot. It's not just enough for us to explain the world and teach, teach students. It's to be engaged in the world. Here's some photos. If you can see on there, I'm talking to Zelensky on his uh, computer. Can you see him there? Uh, that was a few months ago. Uh, and on the left, that's Zelensky speaking to our students in May by uh, a, a video conference. And so I think we got to be engaged. I don't think we can just stand on the sidelines. I think we got to be involved. Um, here's a bunch of programs we have at FSI. Uh, we do a lot of things with Ukrainians. We have for the last 20 years. Um, the last one, teaching more about Ukraine at Stanford, we're not doing that enough, in my view. And, uh, uh, but we're working on that. Um, but, and, and by the way, uh, uh, from those programs, we've had some fantastic alums. I'll just let you read this, but uh, one of them just won the Nobel Peace Prize two weeks ago. Yeah, Stanford, she's a Stanford alum just like you. Go Stanford, right? <laughs> and and Lesya, she's fantastic. She spent 2017, 2018 here uh, at FSI. But all these people, look at what they're doing, incredible things that they're doing. And, and these are our alums, these are our friends, these are our folks. And so I think we can't just analyze that we gotta, we gotta be engaged. And I wanna challenge you to be engaged with us. Okay, all right, thanks for listening. We have some time for questions. Thank you, thank you.